Hello, hi, welcome back to our latest uh, chapter subset in this anatomy discussion. And here we will be discussing the uh, chondries, the coronary artery bypass grafts chondries. Uh, before we start, I would like to thank Mr. Sonal Ori, our clinical lead and lead for education, Mr. Theodore Valiseris, our other cardiac surgery consultant, as well as Mr. Suvatish Luthra, our senior surgical fellow. So, um, before we start, I would like to emphasize on, uh, uh, and highlight a certain principle, the initial, the, the fundamental difference between a planned surgery and an uh, aimless injury is essentially two things. First, uh, during the beginning of the surgery, the surgeon walks in with a solid understanding of anatomy. Hence, he can put a plan in mind, uh, uh, what's his target, what's his aim, why is he dissecting and what is he dissecting, what's to exposing. Uh, what plane is he going into? And that's the first initial uh, difference. The second is at the end of the surgery, the surgeon uh, utilizes uh, uh, hemostatic, uh, sufficient hemostatic and efficient hemostatic techniques in order to stop the bleeding. Uh, the surgeon holds a, a knife, scissors, diathermy. Those are exactly the same tools you will use to inflict injury. We open people's chest, we open people's abdomens. That's ex essentially what happens during injury. However, by utilizing these two fundamental concepts, this is what discriminates surgery from uh, uh, injury. A famous surgeon once said, um, some people just commit surgery. Uh, in this chapter, I will, we are hoping to illustrate and demonstrate the, the uh, anatomical basis you would require during the practical, during the dissection process. Maybe it's not a, a very popular exam topic. However, it is essential to understand that in order to be able to operate safely. So, um, to start with, we will start with the uh, internal mammary artery anatomy. So, as you can see here, the uh, mammary originates from the uh, first, the internal mammary artery originates from the first part of the subclavian artery. We all came to a point when we got mixed up, whether it is first, second, or third. We get confused, and don't worry, this is uh, completely natural. Don't get disappointed. As we usually uh, use in this uh, series, I will uh, provide you with a, a little story to help to remind you. Let me rewind it here. So, uh, the third part of the subclavian artery is essentially outside the chest, almost uh, beyond the limits of the chest wall, and hence it will be uh, highly inconvenient for the mammary to reach its target along the medial side of the chest wall uh, through uh, originating from there. The second part is again originating in a very tight space behind the scalenus anterior so again it is uh, inconvenient the first part is the origin of choice if you would like to call it the this diagram also demonstrates an important point that is the internal memory artery is directly underneath the ribs a high velocity or a high force uh, injury uh, to the ribs at this site which is slightly uncommon um, uh, will die will almost always severe the internal memory artery um, these patients come uh, severely compromised, hemodynamically compromised. Uh, usually, the, the incision of choice to treat or salvage those patients is, uh, I mean, a hemodynamically compromised patient with a chest trauma is uh, the clamshell incision. Except in this particular situation, the uh, approach of choice is not a clamshell incision. And I will explain to you why. So, the uh, approach of choice is cutting the skin subcutaneous and then undermining the muscle and you will find yourself directly on top of the memory. You are benefiting two things in here. One is, uh, first of all, you have full uh, approach or full uh, uh, access to the whole length of the memory. If you do this, clamshell incision uh, is mainly done at the fifth or fourth intercostal space. If the injury is higher up, you will struggle to reach there or will struggle to approach there. That's one. Number two, obviously, the clamshell incision, one of the known or uh, possible uh, inadvertent injuries during that is, cert is essentially cutting the memory. So you are actually uh, adding insult to injury. So um, the, the, the approach of choice is skin subcutaneous, undermine the muscle. The ribs are already broken, so you will be there or immediately. You, will, you should be able to see the two ends of the memory straight away. You can then clip them or divide them or whatever the uh, definitive treatment is. Uh, next, um, as we can see, uh, let me rewind in here. So as you can see, the terminal two branches of the memory are the uh, superior epigastric artery and musculophrenic artery. Next, as you can see, the after we remove the ribs, the, the uh, we are still viewing from the outside. The uh, uh, transverse thoracic muscle is the bed of the memory. This is the muscle you dissect when you harvest the memory from inside. Um, 
This uh, third diagram demonstrates how the uh, veins uh, accompany the mammary in a close uh, distance from the lower half, whereas at the upper half, uh, there is only one vein and also uh, uh, it's a bit uh, uh, more loose. This makes the section of the mammary on the top half is easier, whereas at the lower half, it becomes a bit more uh, difficult. Also, the uh, uh, size of the mammary is, is, is smaller um, at the distal end than the proximal end. However, having said that, the injury at the uh, topmost part of the mammary uh, risks um, failing to use it as a pedicled um, uh, conduit, whereas injuring it at the distal end may or may not cause so. You may still be able uh, to use it as a pedicled uh, 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 conduit. Hence, we find uh, a compromise halfway between, so we start the dissection uh, halfway between the top and the bottom uh, ends of the mammary. Of course, this is not a rule. Some surgeons routinely start from the top, some surgeons routinely start from the bottom, but this is the anatomical basis of it. Uh, another uh, important point I would like to highlight in here is the relation between the proximal most part of the mammary and the phrenic nerve, as you can see here. Uh, um, this explains why uh, during the harvest process, we stop at the edge of the subclavian vein, uh, of the uh, innominate vein, sorry, the left innominate vein. As soon as we see it, we stop to avoid injury of the uh, uh, phrenic nerve. Now, um, this diagram illustrates an important uh, uh, concept in here, the first intercostal space uh, homes uh, or uh, harbors two of the biggest branches of the internal memory, as you can see here the first intercostal artery and the precardiophrenic artery. Um, so uh, failing to dissect or di divide those uh, properly will lead to competitive flow and reduce the lifespan of your uh, conduit. Please make sure when you harvest the memory to ensure that you uh, properly visualize, dissect and divide uh, uh, the branches, any branch you will find in the first intercostal space because these branches could sometimes be equal in equal diameter to the mammary artery. And as we all remember from Postle's law, the resistance in a vascular bed is, the, is uh, essentially uh, governed by the diameter as well as the length. Uh, these branches have almost equal diameter to the mammary, hence they, uh, they, uh, they can provide competitive flow to the mammary and reduce its life uh, span. Next is an important and a very, uh, uh, very interesting uh, clinical uh, situations. The first clinical situation is a patient suffering neurological symptoms, uh, CT and MRI head are all normal. The answer is in a CT angio. The second patient is a patient post cabbage who develops uh, ischemic uh, syndrome, acute coronary syndrome, um, and the angio shows completely patent uh, uh, grafts. These are the two clinical situations which we're talking about. Those are the steel syndromes, not one syndrome. There are two steel syndromes. The first is referred to as the vertebro subclavian steel syndrome. As you can see, it all happens due to a, 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 a stenosis or narrowing of the proximal most part of the subclavian artery before uh, the origin of the vertebral and internal memory artery. As we all know, they originate opposite to each other. This leads to high resistance through the subclavian circulation, driving the blood, hence the blood uh, opts to uh, um, uh, select the pathway of least resistance, and hence is diverted from the right side to the left side of the vertebral basilar circulation, leading to vertebral basilar insufficiency and neurological symptoms, TIA-like symptoms. CT, MRI, all shows normal uh, results, and the answer will be in a CT angio. Next is a patient post cabbage. As you can see here, the same situation happened and hence the blood opts to select the pathway of least resistance through the coronary arteries, diverting the pathway through into the subclavian circulation, which is a bigger diameter, hence less resistance as per Postle's law, and hence the blood travels through that. Uh, remember, the first steel syndrome actually occurs in a native circulation, whereas the second uh, steel syndrome happens post-operative after a cabbage procedure. This concludes the mammary artery um, anatomical description. Next is the uh, description of the radial artery. If I'm to select one single uh, diagram in this chapter subset, which is the most useful, I would select this one. It tells you all you need to know about the anatomy and the harvest of the radial artery. Let's look into, in, into this diagram. So as you can see here, the diagram tells you, essentially can tell you about the incision 
Um, so your incision will start somewhere uh, around the midpoint of the cubital fossa, going all the way down to um, uh, two and a half centimeters or one inch above the proximal rest crease. The incision could be straight or could be a lazy S. Lazy S is an S pulled from either sides. Um, they both provide the same exposure, just the lazy S uh, abolishes the, um, um, brings the incision a little bit more on top of the artery, hence reducing the size of the flap. Uh, this is your incision. This diagram shows you as well your aim, which we spoke about in the initial uh, few seconds of this video. So the aim here is to unfold the medial border of the brachioradialis, and that's where the radial artery will be. So if you dissect the plane between the brachioradialis, as you can see here, this plane and the flexor carpi radialis, this plane is where you will find the radial artery. You need to unfold the brachioradialis out. Um, now, uh, the, this diagram also shows you the two main structures you need to worry about during your dissection process. One is the venae committens. If you injure those, you will end up with a hematoma, which will obscure your field uh, and uh, uh, prevent you from uh, dissecting under vision. Also, it will cause a hematoma postoperative and, uh, and uh, forearm swelling. Also, uh, the second structure is the superficial branch of the radial nerve. Injuring this will lead to paresthesia or hypothesia along the lateral surface of the uh, uh, forearm and the base of the uh, thumb. Um, now, a technical uh, tip here: um, if you find yourself struggling, sometimes uh, uh, the the fascia uh, overlying the radial artery is a bit thick. You cannot visualize the pulsation, or you cannot visualize the artery uh, clearly. So, uh, um, you can uh, easily demonstrate this plane by flexing the wrist uh, slightly and uh, or abducting it at the same time this will express the belly of the flexor carpi radialis and hence you can identify this plane we all know the insertion of the flexor carpi radialis into the base of the second and third metatarsal bones and it creates abduction abduction outside and flexion of the uh, wrist the other technical point please there is no big branch of the radial artery i mean by big uh, a branch which is equal in size or even bigger than the radial artery if you find during your dissection a big branch of the radial artery a branch equal in size or bigger than the radial artery do not dissect it or do not cut it because it might be the ulnar artery yes the this uh, this um, uh, junction point or this uh, bifurcation point is variable it can occur a little lower down can occur at a, a, with a variation in a, in, a, in a very rare occasions, but it may occur. All the branches of the radial artery are muscular branches in the forearm, and hence they are all small muscular branches. If you find a big artery, please stop for a second, dissect it, make sure it's not the ulnar artery. Uh, last but not least, the muscle bed of the radial artery. Six muscles comprise the uh, make up the uh, the bed of the radial artery from top to bottom: the biceps tendon, the supinator muscle, pronator teres, flexor pollicis longus, flexor digitorum superficialis, and flexor uh, uh, and pronator quadratus. Those are the six muscles which comprise the bed of the uh, uh, radial artery. This concludes the uh, section on the uh, radial artery harvest next is the uh, saphenous vein this is uh, fairly straightforward all you need to understand is three landmarks for the long saphenous and three landmarks for the short saphenous so the first landmark is the medial malleolus the second landmark is the uh, uh, behind the patella and the third mark uh, the third landmark is the saphenofemoral junction. Um, um, the course is, t is more or less straightforward. I will explain to you a bit of uh, technical tips in here, which will help you during the harvest process. But as you can see, the the origin uh, or the initial point of the saphenous vein is uh, one inch or um, two and a half centimeters above the highest prominent area of the uh, medial malleolus. Um, the second landmark is uh, two inch or four centimeter, five four to five centimeter behind the patellar prominence and the saphenofemoral junction is uh, one inch below and lateral to the adductor uh, tubercle and then if you connect the lines that's where your uh, saphenous vein uh, is the uh, equally speaking in a comparative manner the short saphenous three landmarks the lateral malleolus and the uh, then the uh, uh, the plane between the two muscle uh, bulks of the gastrocnemius muscle, two muscle bellies of the gastrocnemius muscle, and then the midpoint of the popliteal fossa. A technical tip here. So when you come to the medial malleolus, you will notice sometimes the medial malleolus is, uh, is a bit prominent. It looks like this. 
So which part are you gonna use as your landmark? So the topmost part, the highest, the peak point of the medial malleolus. Remember, sometimes it's a bit bulky. It can deviate you or uh, mislead you uh, half a centimeter away and create a flap. Some surgeons uh, opt not to uh, uh, omit the first few centimeters of the medial malleolus and uh, uh, of the lower leg because it's deficient of subcutaneous tissue and reduces the healing process. Uh, again, it's uh, it's a variable practice. Next. The, uh, the saphenous vein then follows the edge or the border of the gastrocnemius muscle. Uh, as we explained at the landmark 2, it is 2, an, a two inch, uh, 4 to 5 centimeter behind the patellar prominence and then the saphenofemoral junction. In the thigh, there is also another technical tip you can use in here. If you grasp the extensor group of muscle, the front group of muscle, and the adductor, the inner group of muscles, there, there is usually uh, a plane in between. Uh, a recess in between that's where the saphenous vein normally uh, sits of course it's highly variable uh, structure the uh, short saphenous on the other hand has a more more or less midline kind of course it travels from behind the lateral malleolus uh, through a midline kind of course this concludes our section now i will leave you uh, with this mcq question uh, i hope uh, um, um, you enjoyed this uh, uh, this chapter subset and hopefully we'll meet in the next chapter thank you very much